Dr. Lukowitz, you can go ahead. Um, go ahead and start. I think we fixed the problem. There we are. So can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, so I s you're, you're hearing me, but I'm not hearing you. Is that it? Questions in the text box. I do. I see questions. But can you hear me? Because I'm not hearing anything. Okay. So what what should I do next? So I could just go ahead and, and run through the, the PowerPoint. Okay, so I'm going to do it and I'm going to go fast so that uh, there will be time for questions afterwards, uh, which means I'll probably uh, go past some things pretty fast, but the material will be on your website so people can go back and look at it later if they wish to. Uh, so the, the title of my talk is Teeming with Life, which is actually a pun based on a report from the President's uh, Science Council, uh, which was, was called Teeming with Life with two E's, meaning that the planet is just, you know, uh, just teeming with all different kinds of life forms. Uh, but uh, so biodiversity, you can think about it in a number of different ways. You can think about it in terms of all the different species of Hawaiian honey creepers. Uh, you can think about it as a characteristic, the number of species in a given uh, type of habitat. So 10 or 15 species of trees in this particular shot uh, in southern New England. Uh, in this one, you would literally probably have more than 1,000 species of trees. Uh, so that's actually characteristic of particular kinds of ecosystems. Uh, this is to introduce one of the most important figures in the history of biodiversity, uh, a lady named Ruth Patrick who figured out in 1947, uh, studying aquatic organisms, uh, that the number and kinds of species in a stream or river gave you a read not only on its natural conditions, but also on stresses from human activity and the watershed. So biodiversity is integrating all different kinds of pressures, and it's a good way, again, to use it as a characteristic of, in this case, the state of a particular ecosystem. Uh, so this is, there's extraordinary freshwater biodiversity. I just couldn't pass it by there. Like these caddis flies, each of which builds amazing uh, little, uh, uh, not little boxes, but little sort of protective uh, 
devices, in this case, you know, from grains of sand, that's the front end. Uh, it has a one day lifespan as an adult. Uh, and of course, something like a tropical coral reef uh, has astounding biological diversity. Uh, but uh, to help you think about it a bit more, uh, if you look at all the described species of life on Earth, uh, which we've only done maybe 10% of, uh, you will see that uh, that higher plants uh, and plants in general are roughly about a quarter uh, of all those species, uh, the rest being animals and most of them being invertebrates. Uh, so in many senses, uh, we vertebrates are along for the ride on ecosystems run by these kinds of organisms. Uh, and this is seen even more dramatically here, uh, where you see the, the vertebrates on the right hand of the pie chart. Uh, but basically, the world is, is run by the green plants and microorganisms and, and the in, the spineless majority of invertebrates we're just basically along for the ride. Uh, so also give you a sense of diversity within uh, higher plants. Uh, and then there are particular ecosystems like tropical rainforests here in the Western Amazon, uh, which are astoundingly diverse. Uh, and on the, essentially the probably less than 15% of the planet's land area, which is naturally tropical rainforests, you may have as much as half of all the terrestrial uh, biodiversity. Uh, so that's why people spend so much attention um, uh, on conservation of tropical rainforests. Uh, and this will give you another sense of sort of uh, gradients of biodiversity. So look at the bottom of this slide here at the southern tip of South America, and there are only two species of ants. Work your way up the slide and north uh, to uh, the vicinity of Sao Paulo, which is just barely in, within the tropics, and you're already with uh, 200 species of ants. So in many groups of organisms, that pattern is repeated over and over again. Uh, the tropics are uh, the overwhelmingly diverse part of the planet. This will give you a sense uh, of what we actually know about uh, biodiversity. So if you compare Australian insects at the top to to Australian terrestrial vertebrates on the bottom, uh, you will see that uh, in Australia, as almost anywhere else, uh, we know the vertebrates much better than we know the invertebrates. And if you compare Australian insects at the top or British insects on the side, you'll see that uh, in Britain in particular, but the industrialized countries, uh, that we have a much better uh, sense of knowledge of, of, of what species we are sharing uh, our countries with. Uh, so one of the major issues over time has been that most of the scientific expertise has been in those northern countries uh, like our own, uh, when most of the biodiversity uh, is actually in those other countries. Uh, so, tropical rainforest uh, is, you know, maybe like a hundred feet high, uh, and a whole bunch of things live on top of the forest or near the top of the forest. You can't see otherwise. So, back literally 50 years ago, when this tower was built, it was the first one in the Amazon. Uh, and I invited 
invited the world's most famous bird watcher, to, Roger Tory Peterson, to, to come visit the Amazon. And he found out about the tower, and he just had to be on top of the tower uh, at dawn every day. Uh, so there he is, Roger Tory Peterson, uh, essentially 100 feet above the rainforest floor, seen from yet higher in a view I always follow the bird's eye view of Roger Tory Peterson. Uh, so one of the big questions has been, how many species do we share the planet with? Uh, and as we saw earlier, there's roughly 1.4 to 1.5 million species described. Uh, but a Smithsonian insect biologist taking samples from canopy trees in the Peruvian Amazon uh, did some calculations that suggested maybe the total was about 30 million. Uh, and we still don't know. It's somewhere between 10 million and 100 million. Uh, so basically, we've got a long way to go in understanding. Uh, so when I started as a student, the tree of life basically was Two, two trunks, one animals, one plants, and some things down at the bottom. Uh, this is what it's become in recent years. And if you, if you look at the right-hand side of this, you'll see some little twigs, which are animals, fungi, and plants. And all the rest are basically microorganisms, uh, many of which date back to the earliest history of life on Earth. Uh, with strange metabolisms and strange appetites. Uh, and so, once again, that puts us and we vertebrates, in a sense, in our place. Uh, so, biodiversity, of course, is also a set of resources. We're biological entities, and we draw on it in various ways. This is a whimsical way of making that point. It's the various species of plants that go into flavoring gin. Uh, but some of them are actually incredibly important. So uh, about 40 years ago, a new species of, of wild relative of corn was discovered in Mexico. It actually became a front page story in the New York Times. Uh, and as you will have already gathered, finding a new species in the tropics is easy. But what was special about this one was that it was a wild relative of one of our major food crops, um, and that it was perennial, meaning it grows uh, anew from its rootstock every year. It doesn't have to start from seed. Uh, so this is that. Perennial corn, Zia diploperennis, was its Latin name. Uh, and it is the third most important grain in support of human society. The idea of making suddenly corn agriculture into a perennial crop instead of an annual crop, so you don't have to plant it every year, uh, is a really interesting possibility. And it's already proven to be resistant to one of the major uh, diseases of corn. Uh, so, wild relatives of domesticated species are really important. Uh, and down in the bowels of the Manhattan subway system, you can get a sense of the importance of biological resources to uh, economies, uh, because down there in the Astor Place subway station, uh, named for the richest man in America in his time, uh, is the animal, the beaver, uh, which formed the initial uh, source of his fortune. Uh, another really important thing to bear in mind is that there is a constant struggle going on between uh, plant biodiversity and insect biodiversity. Uh, Insects obviously interested in feeding on the plants and plants generating uh, through evolution uh, various 
toxic and noxious compounds to discourage the, the insects from feeding on them. And that actually makes all of this a giant pharmaceutical factory uh, producing really valuable things for medical science. Uh, perhaps the most famous of those is aspirin. It actually was originally prescribed by Hippocrates in ancient Greece uh, as a painkiller, and basically it was done by mashing up willow bark uh, and uh, making it sort of a tea out of it. Nowadays, of course, that the actual molecule is synthesized, uh, but it is still today one of the best-selling medicines of all time and used for more than just dealing with headaches and pain. Uh, another really important way to think about biodiversity is the way it can inspire thinking and discovery in the biological sciences. So this is a Roquefort cheese uh, flavored by a mole, a penicillium mole. Uh, and it was actually penicillium uh, infecting accidentally somebody's culture dishes uh, that led to the whole discovery of antibiotics. So probably everybody listening to this today uh, is healthier uh, because of antibiotics at some point uh, in their lives. So this is basically making an argument that we need to think of the variety of life on Earth, uh, among other things, as a gigantic library of pre-tested solutions in nature, any one of which can transform our understanding of the life sciences. A um, dramatic example of this is the Bushmaster. That's the front end of this big viper from the New World Tropical Forest. Uh, it basically causes its victims' uh, blood pressure to go to zero forever. Uh, and you might wonder what that is worth, but it basically led to the discovery of an unknown system of regulation of blood pressure uh, in, and in uh, mammals and people. Uh, and that in turn led to probably the drug of choice for treating high blood pressure around the world. So literally hundreds of millions of people are living longer and healthier lifestyles, more productive lives uh, because of the biology of this nasty snake in a faraway rainforest. Uh, another thing that biodiversity can be, alluding back to the work of Ruth Patrick, uh, is it can actually serve as uh, a set of indicators about the state of the environment. So some years ago, when frog scientists noticed that a lot of frogs were disappearing around the world, uh, that actually became a front page story uh, in the Washington Post. Uh, so it's basically, uh, if you look at this particular ecosystem, which is a pasture ecosystem, uh, which basically was given lots of fertilizer, uh, it started off on the right uh, in 1856 with 49 species of plants in the pasture, and the stress of the fertilizer by 1949 had reduced it to three species. Uh, so biodiversity, again, as an indicator of the state of an actual ecosystem. And the good news is if the species still exist and they're still in the neighborhood, if you take the pressure off the the stress off the particular ecosystem, it will actually build back its natural biological diversity. Uh, I'm going to give you an example of this on a big scale. So this is a city on the coast of Sao Paulo, a uh, major industrial chemical uh, 
oil refinery kind of place, uh, and it's better now, but when this particular photograph was taken, uh, the effect of the air pollution was so great that it affected uh, the forest on the on the hillsides and mountainsides uh, uh, to the west of it, uh, causing landslides uh, and the like. Uh, so that's just a dramatic example of what I showed you uh, with those graphs. Uh, another thing that biological diversity does is, is in its actual functioning, uh, contributes uh, in important ways to the maintenance of environmental health and the functioning of ecosystems. So right here where I am, close to the Chesapeake Bay, most people think about oysters uh, as you know a great seafood product from the bay. But in fact, its more important function over time has been what the what the oysters do in filtering water. So today, the oysters in the bay filter a volume of, of water in their feeding uh, equivalent to the bay about once a year. Uh, before various things were done that affected the oyster populations, uh, that's what what you're seeing uh, at the top, the 1890s, it probably filtered that equivalent volume to the entire bay about once a week. So there's, in fact, major effort going on to try and restore the oyster beds. Uh, this is a very famous experiment. I won't have time to get into it. But uh, basically, uh, a professor, David Tillman, at the University of Minnesota, has done experiments which show that the functioning of ecosystems is actually di directly related to the level of biodiversity, the number of species in the system. Uh, so productivity increases, uh, and resistance to drought uh, and stability. Uh, so this is no longer something that people like me would have asserted you know, 30 years ago. This has now uh, been wonderfully demonstrated uh, scientifically. Uh, so here's some more of the things that, uh, that basically biodiversity uh, adds to uh, the ecosystems of those experiments. So, a similar kind of ecosystem function uh, involves the Amazon. When you're looking at the Amazon drainage, you'll see it's roughly equivalent to the 48 U.S. states. Uh, and in the center of the basin where the black waters of the Rio Negro meet the muddy waters of the mainstream Amazon, uh, one of the big puzzles for years is how did, how did those rivers actually support the amount of fish productivity uh, that they demonstrably do. Uh, and the answer is that these rivers rise like 20 meters in height, so think 60 feet uh, uh, every year for a period of weeks and months. And much as this fisherman can swim into the floodplain forest, so can the fishes swim into the forest. Uh, and there they feed on fruits and nuts and other organic matter uh, that falls into the water. So the, the productivity of those aquatic fish communities actually is uh, uh, significantly increased by the nutrient inputs from the terrestrial system. Uh, even even piranhas go vegetarian at the high water months of the year. Uh, this shows uh, basically how moisture is generated uh, around the world. Uh, it's a model that I don't have the, the function in to show you, but basically the point here is that 
moisture is generated mostly over the oceans and at the equator. And if you look at the right hand part of the slide there, you will you will see South America and the Amazon. Uh, and that is the major exception to what I just told you, uh, because it actually recycles the water as the air mass moves from the Atlantic to the Andes. Uh, and that's a function of the com complex surfaces of the forest and the trees themselves transpiring in moisture. Uh, and this is what happens when it rains in a particular place in the Amazon. And basically, you'll see that like three quarters of the moisture goes back to the atmosphere and only about a quarter runs off. Uh, what happens if you cut down too much of the Amazon? Uh, basically, it will get hotter and drier. Uh, and at least part of it might be unrecoverable if you do that. Uh, one of the really other interesting things is what plants in particular do, uh, but biodiversity together does uh, with respect to the cycling of carbon on our planet. You have to remember that all life is built of carbon. You and I are built of carbon. Uh, and twice in the history of life on Earth, there have been times when there were really, really high levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, the, what we worry about so much uh, from a climate change point of view. And in both instances, uh, those high levels were brought down to pre-industrial levels of CO2 by natural processes of the planet. The first was when plants emerged on, uh, arrived on land. Uh, the second was with essentially the arrival of modern flowering plants, doing it more efficiently. Uh, so it it shows the power of biology in being able to affect uh, both the the composition of the atmosphere uh, and the climate. Uh, and we will get back to that. So biologists love to study islands, and now we're going to start with islands and look at what's happening to biodiversity. Uh, these are the various parrots of the different uh, Caribbean islands that still exist. Uh, and basically, biologists love to study islands because they're smaller and you can mostly understand all that's going on. Uh, and so if you look at the Hawaiian Islands, uh, the state with the most endangered species in the 50 US states, uh, you will see that uh, even before Captain Cook arrived and got his not very nice welcome, uh, that there were species of Hawaiian honeycreepers being driven to extinction. Uh, and so this will give you a sense of the amount of, of extinct species in Hawaii. It's a huge number. Uh, and importantly, that some of this was done by native Hawaiians uh, long before the arrival of any Europeans. Uh, and that pattern occurs again and again around the world. Uh, so indigenous peoples are not necessarily uh, always totally in tune and good for uh, their actual environment. So here's an example from Hawaii of what happens inadvertently when you introduce a species. In this case, I brought in a mongoose to control rats or something like that. Uh, and in, it did a fine job against rats, but it also began to eat the local bird species too. Uh, and, and this is perhaps the most famous example of an introduced species kind of problem. The Stephen Island wren, the first and last specimens, uh, which were captured by the lighthouse keeper's uh, cat. So it's, it's 
swiftly went to extinction. Uh, invasive species are also a problem when we move species to places where they are not native. So this is uh, a comb jellyfish, a beautiful animal actually, uh, from the west coast of Western Hemisphere or the East Coast of the Western Hemisphere, uh, and it got into ballast water in, in ships and ended up in the Black Sea, where it basically undercut uh, a quarter of a billion dollar a year uh, anchovy fishery. So species ending up where they don't have their natural checks and balances is a serious issue, and especially on islands. Uh, habitat destruction. So here we're looking at the central Amazon, forest cleared to make way for paddle, cattle pasture. Actually not a very economic activity, uh, but when you hear about tropical deforestation, this is what it looks like. Uh, and in the early 80s, uh, a road project in western Brazil began to lead to major deforestation. You see the difference uh, between 1982 and 1985, and it's, deforestation is still a big problem to, in the Brazilian Amazon. Uh, and one of the things that happens uh, as habitat is encroached upon, uh, is exemplified by this time sequence of forest on the in the coastal forest of Brazil. So we're looking at 1945 and 1960 and 1990. So not only is the total amount of forest or habitat reduced but generally speaking, it ends up in fragments. Uh, and this will give you an example you know, from a county or township in Wisconsin from 1831 in the upper left down to 1950 on the right. So it, this happens almost everywhere in the world that humans are present and development is going on. And uh, People didn't really take habitat fragmentation very seriously until essentially in the beginning of the 1970s, people began looking at some data. Uh, one of the very first was to look at this island uh, in the middle of Gatun Lake, created for the Panama Canal. Uh, so what had once been part of continuous habitat became an island, uh, and it was island for science, so people were recording which birds were there uh, over time. And in the 1920s, at the outset, there were 208 species of breeding birds. <coughs> By 1970, uh, 45 of those were extinct, and 18 uh, were attributed directly to the effects <coughs> of the isolation. So habitat fragmentation is a really big issue, uh, putting connections back between fragments uh, in, in the landscape is an important thing to do. And it has big implications for how you design national parks and how you manage them. Uh, so that led me to start a giant experiment about 38 years ago in the middle of the Amazon uh, when clearing was going to take place uh, to essentially make cattle pasture. So this is the experiment, or part of it, uh, at the very beginning. There's a one hectare fragment uh, on the right, and I think it's a 10 hectare fragment on the left. Uh, and I won't go into it in any great detail, uh, but Habitat fragmentation is a big conservation issue. Uh, this is also going to look at 
the way we distort uh, big cycles like nitrogen cycles. Uh, and what you basically see here is a dead zone off the map of the Mississippi River uh, in, uh, in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and that's basically caused by runoff of lots of excess fertilizer uh, from the agricultural midsection of the United States. So the number of dead zones around the world has been doubling every decade uh, for the last four decades. Uh, and there you can just see you know, how it all drains down in, into the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and this is the That is the list of some of those dead zones. Uh, there are many more since that particular image was created. So one of the things that happens, uh, particularly in the tropics, is the use of fire in clearing natural habitat. <clears throat> and so what happens is an enormous amount of carbon that was in living systems ends up as CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and here you're looking at uh, uh, a smoke cloud uh, in western Brazil, that same area I showed you, uh, the images of clearing. Uh, and on this particular day, September 1987, there are actually two and a half thousand individual fires going on. And this is in 1997 when there was a smoke cloud as big as Brazil uh, hanging over uh, South America. Uh, and that all, all adding CO2 to the atmosphere. Uh, this all, all adding CO2 to the atmosphere. Uh, this is the very famous curve of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere, uh, measured from a Hawaiian volcano. And as you see, it goes up and down every year, uh, although the overall trend is up. And the important thing to remember is that when it goes down, uh, it uh, is actually springtime in the northern hemisphere. And that burst of growth trees leafing out, etc., actually pulls down a significant amount of carbon. Uh, again, making the point that the biology of the planet is very important in how we manage the atmosphere. Uh, so climate change is happening. The polar bear is the poster child for it. Uh, it's one of my areas of expertise. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, except to make the point uh, that it's really important as animals try and track their uh, required conditions that they actually have places that they can go and not run into obstacles uh, as illustrated in this cartoon. Uh, so tropical coral reefs are already showing the high sensitivity to the climate change that's taken place. Uh, it's a really serious problem in the oceans uh, because basically this is what happens to tropical coral reefs, reefs after not very much uh, warm water, uh, not for very long. It's called the bleaching event. Uh, and we're also seeing the impacts in our western forests, uh, in North America, the coniferous forests were as tip the balance in favor of the native bark beetles. Uh, so this, I think, has a sequence in it uh, that shows British Columbia and outbreaks uh, and. I think I'll let it run through, even though it takes a few moments, uh, because you'll see that it really increases over time. And that's because the winters are longer, uh, the, winter, the summers are longer, and the winters are warmer.
So there are places in these forests where literally 70% of the trees are dead. So I anyway, I think we better move on here. I so there have been five major extinction events in the history of life on Earth. Uh, we probably are at the beginning of the sixth one, if we allow it to go on. Uh, and that's the big if, because we don't have to. Uh, so in any particular case, there will be some immediate causes of, of habitat destruction and extinction. This is Central America at one point. Uh, driving all of this at one level is world population growth. There are now three times as many people in the world as when I was born. Projections are for at least nine billion. Uh, so we really have to think about how we can meet the needs of those people without destroying more nature. And it is possible. Uh, and it's really important to set up protected areas. So uh, this was a plan uh, from about 1990 for the Amazon. Much of that, I'm happy to say, is actually taking place. Uh, there's restoration, as in returning oysters to the Chesapeake. And then there's this whole issue about CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, and every year there's a there are sources of CO2 going in the atmosphere and things which remove it. Uh, and it is possible to play with this equation uh, and actually pull some CO2 out of the atmosphere uh, and actually put it back into living biological systems. Uh, so that's the really good news here. Uh, there may be half a degree of climate that we can climate change we can avoid by doing forest restoration. Uh, this is the annual sort of equation. Uh, upper left is tropical forest destruction, primarily below, below it is five times as much of CO2 from burning ancient ecosystems, the fossil fuels and half going into the atmosphere and the rest between land and oceans. Uh, so I am pushing very hard for what I call re-greening the emerald planet, uh, doing ecosystem restoration at scale. Uh, and that's not just rainforests, it's, it's grasslands, it's agricultural ecosystems. Uh, it's coastal wetlands, and it's something that everybody can do. So to, to sum up, I'm going to give a couple examples of benefits from biodiversity that most people are aware of. Most people think of Yellowstone as Old Faithful. Uh, they don't know that it is the home of a bacterium uh, which made a reaction called the polymerase chain reaction possible. Uh, it basically is a reaction that multiplies genetic material. So it's revolutionized uh, diagnostic medicine, forensic medicine, and made the Human Genome Project possible, a whole bunch of other science. Probably bought, brought a trillion dollars of, of benefits so far. Uh, and it only works because there needed to be a heat resistant enzyme uh, that could make the, the reaction a chain reaction. And that enzyme actually lives in the hot springs in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, so looking ahead at the great challenge of, of avoiding the sixth extinction, uh, I think one of our greatest allies actually is nature itself. If people can actually stop for a minute and get outside and see it, uh, they can be struck by the wonder and beauty of it. Uh, and I have this slide on the screen uh, 
because it is uh, the flower of a plant extinct in the wild called Franklinia, named for Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and it was named by uh, John Bartram, an illiterate uh, colonial farmer in Pennsylvania who gave his mule a rest one day and he just happened to look at a flower and he was so blown away by it uh, that he decided he wanted to be a botanist. Uh, so that meant he had to become literate and meant he had to learn Latin, the sciences of Latin. Uh, and Benjamin Franklin actually was able to get him made uh, royal botanist uh, for the colonies. Uh, so I think that capacity for astonishment and inspiration exists in all of us uh, if we just give people the opportunities to actually see uh, biodiversity uh, close at hand. So I think that is the end of my talk. So I see some questions on the side here. Would you like me to uh, respond to them? So one question was, how was it serving under the Reagan, Bush, and Clinton administrations? Uh, and the really interesting thing was science was taken seriously uh, by all those administrations. Uh, and George Bush, H.W. Bush, thought science was so important that his science advisor was present at all important discussions. And when I joined that council, uh, the president invited us to have our first meeting at Camp David. Uh, it's not easy to see right now what is actually happening about science. Uh, so there's a question here about if only the most hardy organisms survive. Uh, how do the less hardy ones survive in the first place? Uh, so, so basically there is a sorting out that goes on when there's a lot of pressure on ecosystems and biodiversity. Uh, and it's true, the weedy species uh, and, the, and the hardy ones uh, tend to make it. Uh, it's not a great biodiversity uh, base to organize a civilization on. Uh, but you can go to a place like Haiti and actually see what it's like. Uh, deforestation is so bad in Haiti uh, that one of my colleagues described the country as the unthinkable experiment no scientist would be allowed to conduct. What happens to a society when you strip the biology uh, out of the country? So here's a good question. If there are so many biodiverse, so many species, then could similar species, could they evolve into the same one? Uh, so most of the time, what happens in evolution is uh, a species begins to experience different things in different parts of its geographic range. Uh, maybe a population gets separated. And if the evolution could, goes far enough uh, before they reconnect, uh, then they can't interbreed in their distinct species. Uh, but if they should get back into contact before that point, uh, they would actually uh, 
intrograde is the technical word, but uh, you would end up with a single species, slightly different than it had been before, uh, but nonetheless essentially the same species. Uh, So jellyfish, uh, well, they do, they do have, um, they do have some organs. They have reproductive organs, um, and uh, they have, if I remember correctly, they have a, a sort of a larval stage, uh, then develops into. Uh, the larger organisms that we know, and they're actually quite beautiful. Some of them are not fun to get stung by, uh, and they they do have these really uh, very effective stinging cells. And there are in fact some mollusks which feed on jellyfish uh, and use those keep the cells intact and use them for their own defense. So there's a comment about solutions. I am all about solutions. Let's find a way to, to solve these problems. Uh, and so that I, the course I teach at George Mason is all about solutions. Uh, and you might want to tune in uh, Earth Day weekend. Uh, I'm sure it'll be available on the web. Uh, there will be an Earth Optimism Summit uh, at the Smithsonian, which will be focusing entirely on solutions and trying to provide inspiration. Uh, so this last question is about cost associated with conservation. Um, so it all comes down to individual cases, of course. Uh, there is extensive uh, studies of all of this. I think you could just go out on the web and find some, some first examples, and one will lead you to another. Uh, generally speaking, whether it's conservation or some other kind of environmental problem, uh, it's so much cheaper uh, to invest in conservation and avoid the problem to begin with rather than try and put things back. Uh, it's, it's, it is truly analogous to, it's a lot easier to keep the toothpaste in the tube than try and put it back in. Uh, so, so here's something here about when I was at Brookfield. Yeah, George Rabb is still a good friend of mine. Very active still today in conservation. One of the things he's really interested in, in, in is how do you actually get people to care? Uh, and I think that's an ongoing task for us all. Uh, but exposure to nature and just opening people's eyes to it, uh, making them understand that these are living things and that they're quite wondrous. Uh, can certainly help us. Great. So I think we're probably at the end, aren't we? It's like one minute to the hour. Well, I really enjoyed it. And Give people my email address if, if they would like to email me questions afterwards. I'll do my best to get to them. Great. So 
I think you probably have your next speaker.